Hello guys. For this video, I want to study the effect of a series of concentrated loads in a more real life scenario uh, for a truss. But the truss is going to be the one that we just did before in another video. I don't remember what was the video, but we're going to I'm going to show it to you right now. So this is the example that I did I did before for you guys. Uh, we have the to draw the influence lines for these members here but now I'm going to modify that and see what happened when we did that we got these influence lines IH, LM, CD and LH you can go back and review the video no you can go back and review the video no go back and review the video so for this particular problem what I'm interested in doing is using those influence lines to determine the maximum loads in these bars, or on these bars, or these bars are subject to IH and LH, these two bars, due to this HL93 load. The H, uh, HL93 load is a standard load for Ashto, uh, which includes several combinations. It includes uh, One of them is a HL, uh, HS2044 vehicle, uh, with 72 keep, which is this one, is a is a vehicle that has 8 keep, 32 keep, and 32 keep per axle. Uh, with these loads, the distance between the front axis, as you can see here, is 14 feet, and the distance between the the second and the third axis is between 14 feet and 30 feet. Uh, so one of the, con the one of the one of the combinations for this load is. You're going to use these as a moving load, and you're going to also apply a 640 pounds per line uh, per linear foot, or 0.64 kip per linear foot, as a live load, uniform live load. The other combination will be this load, which is a tandem load, 25 kip, two axes, separated four feet apart, plus also the lane load. Remember, those are live loads and the live loads can move and this is the idea of using influence lines because we're going to place then these loads to maximize the effect tension and compression in this case for those bars there's another case which is two vehicles in two adjacent spans two of these vehicles plus the lane load in two adjacent spans to maximize the negative moment but there's only one span here, so I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to do the combination of this plus this for live load and the combination of this and this for live load. After that, you can also add, you can also add, no, you should also add the dead load. But I'm not, I don't have any information about dead load here, but I, I will explain you later on how you will add for that load. So remember, uh, we're going to use the influence lines generated before. And I prepare a better drawing just to show this, to demonstrate this uh, example. And this is the drawing that I'm going to be using for this. This is the influence line that we detect that we calculated in that example for the member IH. Now, what is the next step? The next step is applying the loads. What loads do we have? We have two loads. What are the two loads that we have? We have the HS2044 vehicle and we have also the lane load. Now for the HS2044 uh, vehicle, first of all, you have to, uh, let me tell you this before I forget, because I might forget at the end. You remember a bridge like this? Usually it's made out of two, and I explained that before, two trusses. So you might have one truss here, and the other truss here, and then you have this truss here, and then you have the other truss, and these trusses are, I don't know. Uh, it should be the same one like this one, but I don't want to spend all all the video just drawing these things again uh, Whatever something like that and the other one is going to be also the same th the same thing here same truss Supported here supported here supported here, and then you have These and the vehicles are circulating here That means that whatever we're calculating we're using one truss the load of the vehicle or the final response at the end, we have to divide this by two because we have two trusses. Just in case I forget to tell you, I don't think I will. But whatever we find at the end, remember, we have to divide by two. So this is what we have. Now, 
these are cars, right? These are cars. The cars can go in either direction. They can go in this direction or you can go in that direction, unless you have a bridge that is only going in one direction. But in this case, let's assume that the cars can go in either direction, either like that or like that. And because of that, I'm going to use this. So I just drew this for demonstrating purposes for you. Scale. So what we have to do, if this is the vehicle, and I drew this at scale, kind of a scale, it's not perfect, but it's uh, sufficient for our purposes. So if we have this, I'm going to start with first, I'm going to say the truck is approaching from the left, from left. Or let's say that it's going in this direction, the truck. When the truck is going in this direction, you have to see the axis. The axes are there. And we have to stop whatever we think the maximum uh, effect is going to be happening. Definitely not here, because you see, this 32 is going to be 0. This 32 here is going to be a small value. And this A keep is going to be affected by that air value. But as we keep moving and moving and moving and moving, let's say that we are going to consider this when the load is in this position as one of the biggest possible effects because it looks like it's one of the biggest possible effects that we have in this part. So I don't know, you refer that as whatever you want to refer. If you remember from the old video, this was A, B, C, D, E, F. So I'm going to refer this as the middle, middle axis uh, at C when the middle axis is located at C. Now, the beautiful thing, or the beauty of the influence lines, is that when we built this, we built a unit load. This is created by the unit load. But if we are in the elastic range, and everything remains linear elastic, which is the assumption, if before I put a load of 1, and I had an effect here, for example, of negative 1.2, well, if my load is now 32 kip, the, com the total effect produced by this wheel in that position will be 32 times that, and this will be 8 times that, and this will be 32 times that. And this is the way we do it. So let's start in this way. Let's start from the center one. So the effect when the wheel is there, it will be 32 times 1.2, negative, because everything is negative, 32 1 .2, uh, times 1.2. Now we have the front wheel. The front wheel, we have to interpolate and we have to find how much is the value at that point. And we can do that because we can interpolate and say 1.2 is as 40. But when the vehicle is located in that position, the distance between these two wheels is 14 feet. 14 feet, that means that there are going to be 6 feet between the location that I'm looking for to find that value, it's going to be 6 feet, and, and the actual location that I have. So I can say that 1.2 is as 40, and then this distance is going to be 26. That value itself, 1.2, 1.2 divided by a 40 multiplied by 26 is 0 0.78. That will be this value here, 0 0.78. So the, what we have to do is multiply 8 kips times that. For this one, same approach, exactly the same thing. I need to know how much is that value at that point. And for that, I, I have to see what happened here with the vehicle. So this is 26. So this is 20. That means that this distance here is going to be 6 also. So 6 at 6 feet from here, I need to know how much is that, because I know 0 0.8 is that. So what do I do? I said, I can say 1.2 if I want to, 1.2 divided by 60. Or I can use 1.8 divided by 40, which is the same thing. Multiply by, because I use 1.2 uh, 1 and 60, now I have to multiply that by uh, 
uh, this is 20, 40 minus 6, 34. That will be the interpolation. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to plot those values in every single step. I'm just going to do now so you can review it later on. 1.2 divided by 60 multiplied by 34. That is 0.68. So this value here should be 0 0.68. And 0 0.68, when I put my vehicle like that, is affected by this 32 keep load. So it's going to be times 32. Let's calculate this. So you have 32 times 1.2 plus 1.2 divided by 40 multiplied by 26 multiplied by 8 plus 1.2 divided by 60 times 34 times 32. And the value is 66.4 keep. And that will be the compression, because it's negative, right? The compression and the member IH when the load, the vehicle, that vehicle is in that position. Now, this is not the only position, and this can keep moving. So we can try up to, there's going to be a moment, there's going to be a point that you're going to get this easier. But we can, by inspection, you can determine what is going to be the maximum value just by looking at it. But let's say that I'm not so sure, and I want to keep moving, and I want to move this, let's say, to this position, where the front wheel, the front axis is at B. So let's let's calculate that to see what happened, and let's make that a second choice. Let's say the front axis at B. If this is the case, I'm going to have 8 times 0.6. The last one is 32 times 0.8. And now let's interpolate for the middle one. The middle one, once again, this value here is 1.2. And I can say 1.2 is as 40. Let me do that. 1.2 divided by 40 multiplied by multiplied by the distance from here to here. Now this is 14 and this is 20, so it's going to be 34 and multiplied by 32. 34. That's the distance. That's the that's the influence value multiplied by 32, and 32 is the the value in keeps for that. Let's calculate that calculator. My back is hurting because I have been doing this the whole day. 8 times 0 0.6 plus 32 times 0.8. So you better go and like them at least. 32 times 0.8 plus, even if you don't, 1.2 times 34 divided by 40 times 32 equals 63.04 kip. You see, it's close. But the other one is uh, still bigger. This is the one controlling so far. And if we keep moving in this direction, then we realize that there's not going to be any other possibility bigger than the one that we decided before. Now, there's another thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is now the truck now can go in the other direction. So let's flip this truck. The truck can come in this direction. Now, let, what happens when this truck is moving in this way? When the truck moves in this way, I can be here in this position, and this is going to be 32 times 1.2. But look, this 32 load how far away it is, and how little influence has. So basically, this is not going to be governing. It could be somewhere, somewhere around here. But as you can see, the multiplication of these values never ever is going to be as much as that one. That would be for the truck load. Now, we have the other alternative. The other alternative is the tandem load. Tandem load is a, is the tandem load configuration is two loads, 25 kit each. This is like a tra trailer and sometimes it's because of the army. But you have a 25 kit, 25 kit separated by four feet. The four kit here between both of them. And we do the same thing. We move this thing over the influence line. Da, 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 it has to be here, right? As close as, as possible over there. So you can do a quick checkup. 
because these two are so close this is just for expediting the process uh, I'm gonna calculate it correctly but I'm gonna expedite the process you know this distance is really 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 close so I'm gonna put both of them at the same point this is a really long bridge so if I put both of them at the same point this is gonna be 50 50 multiplied by 1.2 this is gonna be 60 60 is smaller than that so I don't have to check it everything but just for the sake of doing it correctly I'm going to say 25 times 1.2 25 times 1.2 plus the other 25 multiplied by this influence factor here that influence factor here is going to be 1.2 divided by 20, 40, 60 multiplied by 20, 40, 60 minus 4, 56 which is always going to be smaller than what I did before but just for the sake of creating a creating a correct answer it will be this plus 25 times uh, 1.2 times 50, 60 divided by 60 that will be 58 58 kip. and this is uh, smaller than that so for this particular case the load that I show you uh, is uh, controlling this part is controlling so this part is controlling here now this is for the moving concentrated loads now ASHTO also prescribes a 640 as I said before 640 pounds per linear foot of load where, where, are, you? where are you here 640 pounds per linear foot that uh, is a movable load and that load accounts for I don't know the vehicles that are parked in the in the truck at a certain time that can be just forming a lane and that type of situation by the way one of the things that I didn't mention but I said it I think I said it here that the, the this design truck the distance between the two first axes first and second axes is, is 14 feet but the distance between the second and third axis is, it varies from 14 to 30 feet what I did here for this particular case I'm using 26 just because this is an example and I have to have a distance uh, these distances in real life you what you do is that you do it at 14 to 30 and maximize which one is the biggest value between those distances also but anyway let's continue now let load uh, like uh, concentrated load for concentrated load it's even easier what you do is that you do the whole area now not the influence line but the influence area and multiply by that load because that load is going to produce the maximum possible effect here everywhere 1640 pounds per foot or 0 0.64 kip per foot which is the same what you do is that you take this area what is this area? The area of this influence line. This is 100 and this is 1.2. So it's going to be 100 times 1.2 divided by 2 and multiply that by your omega, your distributed load, 0 0.64, and that will be. Thirty-eight point four. Thirty-eight point four. Total life load for this design from the truck, sixty-six point four kip truck. From the lane load, thirty-eight point four lane. At the map, one hundred and four point eight keep with that force that force that will be the force that we will use for design now remember what I told you before if we're going to design that bar now remember what I told you before there are two trusses so this load I have to divide by two because every one of the trusses or I divide the loads of the car by two which is the same from the beginning so if I divide this by two now my load is going to be 52.4 kip 
for compression, which makes sense is in compression. By the way, we calculate it, we determine it. But if you if you have a load like that and you bend it, the top chord is going to be in compression. The bottom chord is going to be in tension. Now. Whenever you calculate and you do this type of situations, start thinking, please start thinking. 52.4 kip. If I have to design that, I know this is not the design course, but I start thinking like that. If I have to design that bar, big picture, really approximated. Of course, I have to include the, the, the dead load. So it will be this value, live load multiplied by 1.6. Dead load, dead load, whatever value it is multiply by 1.2, get the total load, include all the other uh, ambient effects, get the total load. Now if you want to do just a big, big crude approximation, what do you do? You select the type of steel. What type of steel it is? I don't know, let's use a 36 KSI steel. If you do 36 KSI steel, and this is the, this is the amount of kips that you have, you divide that by 36, and you have 1.5 square inches. 1.5 square inches is the area, big picture, not factor, only due to the to live load. For that thing, 1.5 is this, that area like that. That's nothing. That's nothing. So, but this is what it is according to the design. I hope that you like this part. Now, let's do the next part. The steel is such a wonderful construction material. Now, the other part is for the member LH, this part here, LH. And we're going to do the design for LH, the same thing that we did before. But now, as you can see, the influence line for that bar could be tension and compression. This point here, because these are the same, this point here is 10. I'm just going to put it there because I know I'm going to need it. And we do the same approach. But now we have to assume tension for the tension part. And I'm going to assume the car moving from left to right. This is my car. If my car starts moving from left to right, my truck, and I start going here, while it's in this area, everything is in compression start moving to the tensile area or influence but you see this is in the tensile but this is still in compression so keep moving keep moving keep moving keep moving keep moving now probably we have probably no we have tension but if you realize I have these two things in tension multiplied by this factor but I have this huge compression going on here still so I keep going compression still, I keep going. Okay, I might have some tension there. That could be a, a value for a comp tension. This is gonna be zero. But this 32 is gonna multiply, it's gonna be multiplied by that little influence area there. I don't think that's gonna be. So if you keep moving and you reach this point, now everything is gonna be in tension again. And this value is, is, is a big value. So 32 multiplied by 0 0.448 plus this 8 times 0, because you are there. And now you have this other, this other part here that you can add the point 0 0.448 divided by 40 multiplied by this distance, or you can use 0 0.224 divided by 20 is the same, multiply by this distance, and this distance is 14 feet, multiply by 32 kip. That will be the influence, uh, the tension caused by the truck in that position over there. Now you have 0 0.448 divided by 40, multiply by 14, multiply by 32, plus 32 times 0 0.448, and that should be 19.35 kip. You can try this location if you want to. Uh, 
I don't think it's gonna do anything. I'm just gonna do it in the calculator really quick. So this is gonna be 0 0.448 divided by 40 multiplied by the distance from here to here. What is this distance from here to here? This is gonna be 10, right? This is 26, meaning if this is 26, this is gonna be 13, uh, no 13, 16, 16. Uh, so this is gonna be 24 multiplied by 24 multiplied by 32 that's 8 8 this influence and if you add this one it's never gonna be it's never gonna be that so we can we can forget about that now the other thing will be the mi middle here but it's not gonna happen also it's gonna be really small so I'm not even gonna try to do that. Now the the other possibility is the truck going in the other direction. This it goes in this direction. The eight is gonna be here. That's not gonna that's not gonna do anything good. And if I put it here, the 32, then I'm gonna have a negative value. I mean, a negative value, no, a compressive value here that is gonna be affecting the tensile. So it's not gonna happen in that way. The other possibility could be if I use the tandem. Tandem could be. So let's try the tandem load. Tandem load. If I use the tandem load, if you wanna do what I did before, just try this really quick and say, okay, 0.448 times 50. 22.4, oh, 22.4 is bigger than 19. I'm not saying that 22.4 is the value, but it's something that is worth it to be checked out. So I'm gonna put it like that for tandem load. It's gonna be 25 times 0.448 plus the influence value of 25 here. How much is that? This is four, meaning this is gonna be 40 minus four, 36. That's gonna be the value over there. Okay, let's do that. When the load is in tandem, right there, 25 times 25 times 0 0.448, and the other one is gonna be 0.448 divided by 40 multiplied by 36. 0 0.448 divided by 40 multiplied by 36. Remember, this is just the ratio multiplied by the other tandem load of the other load of the tandem, which is 25, and that will be. 25 times uh, 0 0.448 plus 0.448 divided by 40 multiplied by 36 multiplied by 25. And that's 21.28, 21.28 kip, which is bigger than that one. So in this case, the tandem load controls over the other one. Now, what do we have to do extra for adding the for calculating the load intention. For calculating the load intention, we have to add now the lane load of 0 0.64 kip per foot. Now remember those are live loads. So I'm going to place that distributed rectangular distributed load wherever maximizes the effect. And that will be only in the tensile part since I'm using I'm looking only for tension. 0 0.64 kip per foot. Now I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna multiply by that area. 0 0.64 multiplied by the area of this which is 20, 40, 50 and this is 0 0.448 the influence area in tension. So it's going to be 0 0.64 times 50 times 0 0.448 divided by 2. 0.64 times 50 divided by 2 times 0.448 and that will be 7.17 7.17 7 kip. So now my total load in tension, tensile load, on that bar will be 21.28 plus 7.17 and this is a total of 28.45 kip. 
As in the previous case, remember we have two trusses supporting that, so my load should be half of that. And that will be whatever it is, I don't know, 28.45, 14.5, I don't know what I'm using the calculator, 14.23 kip. That will be my load, live load, non-factor live load. I have to get that, factor it out, get the dead load, apply the dead load, combine them. Now, for compression, because this is symmetric, it's the same. This is going to be the same load in tension than in compression. And you can play with your car. You can pass your car over there. You can start checking it. It's not going to be in this direction, but it's going to be in that direction. Whenever, whenever I put the car and I start placing the car in these locations like that, you're going to find the maximum load in compression. And then you're going to go with the tandem also. You're going to put your tandem over there and calculate it. There is an important fact here. If I have the dead load, and I have to incorporate the dead load here, remember dead load acts everywhere. It's not that I can move the dead load wherever I want to move it. So if I have a dead load in this problem, which I don't, but if I have it, I have to place the dead load everywhere. And whatever is the value, I have to get this area multiplied by the dead load and add it but I also have to get this area multiplied by the dead load and subtracted. In this case, it's going to be the same because the areas are the same. But usually they are not. But just keep in mind that the dead load acts everywhere, whereas the live load, I just place it to maximize uh, the effects. Well, this is a nice example. I hope that you like it. Keep learning. Keep watching. Keep liking. And come prepared, please, to class. So, see you next class, see you next video, have a good day.